Hi everybody, welcome to the Stellium Astrology Podcast. I'm Stephanie James, your host. I'm the founder of StelliumAstrology.com. I used to write horoscopes for Elle magazine and I am a tutor at the London School of Astrology. And today I'm recording a podcast episode for you. I've had a few Mercury retrograde issues today, loads of Mercury retrograde issues. I was waiting. I was like, when's it going to start? Like, when's he going to start messing with me? And he finally did. Anyway, so this is uh, another video episode, which is also audio. Um, this one may be, I mean, it depends on your preferred format. Um, this will be going out on YouTube as well as uh, to all the podcasting platforms. Um, but I will be looking at a chart. So I will do my absolute best to make it uh, translate to audio as well as visual. Um, before we get started, um, you'll notice I'm wearing my jumper. Um, it's a bit chillier now. It's definitely the, I can feel the shift in the uh, seasons in the UK. And uh, I've just had soup for lunch because um, I, I always know when it's starting to get chilly because A, the jumpers start coming out and all the dresses get pushed to the back of the wardrobe and um, I suddenly start craving for soup. And I just made myself a delicious uh, parsnip, roast potato and quinoa soup that I make a big batch of and then I can just graze on it as and when the mood takes me. So um, just had my lunch and um, I've got my tea in front of me. I've got myself an echinacea tea because I have got what I feel like is the the onset of a cold and I know I'm going to get one because my baby boy's had a cold and um, it's just inevitable that I'm going to get it. So I've uh, Mars is one degree away from my ascendant and I can feel the energy of this um you know usually um Mars being like the lesser malefic usually is uh when he crosses the ascendant from the 12th he usually brings with him any kind of illness from overwork or just general um mingling in that kind of collective soup of the 12th house um, so yeah, I've definitely, um, with my little boy in nursery and me being, you know, doing my, doing my thing, um, out and about and taking him to classes and stuff and seeing lots of people and being involved in lots of things. I've definitely exposed myself to all the ailments that are currently circulating and I, I'm just on that brink, but hopefully my echinacea tea will help to stave it off for a little bit longer because I will be presenting um, at the AA conference on Sunday at uh, I think 11 o'clock in Zoom room four. I'm going to be presenting the, uh, oh gosh, what's my subject? Archetypes. Let me just pull up my thing so I can read up exactly what it is that I'm talking about. I'm talking about <laughs> archetypes reimagined for the digital era. Um, I'll just read what the blurb says. So um, uh, content consumption has evolved into binging seasons of our favourite shows to high quality cinematic experiences in the comfort of our own homes. However, ancestral stories echoing through the collective unconscious never change. In this talk, Stephanie explores ancient and familiar tales in film and TV as modern mythological archetypes. So, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. And it's been a talk that I've been thinking about pulling together for a very long time and it just so happens that uh, it got chosen for the AA conference and so I've been sitting down working on a lot of it um, over the past few months and more so over the past few weeks more intensely so um, so um, if you're interested in joining up I'll put a little link in the description for the Astrological Association conference which is in the UK and it's online so you can join it and it's kind of I always describe festivals as kind of like a um, uh, the conferences are a little bit like festivals, a little bit like Glastonbury for astrologers. Uh, the one, the ones in the UK are a bit smaller. They're not quite as big as some of the US ones I've heard. Um, so they're um, not quite Glastonbury. I'd say more like a local festival, um, something a bit smaller. But um, usually there's like about four talks going on at the same time. You have to choose which one you want to go to. You can't go to all of them. And then, you know, if there's a talk you've missed, you can buy it afterwards and stuff like that. So um, it's always really good fun. You meet loads of cool people. Um, it's the first online conference that I will have done, um, but I'm still excited to do it. And I still really want to see some other talks. So hopefully I'll uh, manage to get along to those and, um, you know, get to mingling myself, actually, because it's been a while. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested, I'll put a link for that. But today what I wanted to do was I wanted to have a little chat about um, the passing of our Queen Elizabeth II, who, um, you know, it's... It feels very double-edged to me because um, I have great respect for Queen Elizabeth and for the 
service to her country, the work she did. I watched The Crown and I loved that TV show. Um, it really humanised the royal family for me. It really helped me to feel like, um, you know, they were normal people, as normal as you could be being brought up in, the, in that environment, who were, you know, have normal impulses and normal, um, you know, they're just like us, you know, like they fall in love. Um, there are temptations in life and, um, you know, some are less uh, dedicated to their designated work that they have to do. So obviously, um, you know, watching that TV show was really interesting to me. And, um, you know, you never completely, I, I, there were points when I'm watching it and I feel like I'm watching the Queen, you know, especially with the young Claire, is it Claire Foy who plays her? Um, you know, just a very, very good actress who plays the Queen very well, I thought, uh, the young Queen. And, you know, I, I just, if you haven't seen The Crown, it is fantastic. I was recommending it to somebody literally um, a couple of days ago. Um, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed um, watching The Crown. I'm just going to shrink down my screen for a moment. <clears throat> now, anyway, let's pull up the chart. So um, let's have a quick look um where is she where is where is she uh share screen there we go so there we've got my um chart up there the astrology chart and um let me pull it over here a little bit more so we have queen elizabeth ii um 21st of april 1926 at 2 40 british summer time which is universal time plus one um for anybody who's working from universal born in uh, London in the United Kingdom. Now, um, yes, the reason why it's double-edged for me is because I know that the Queen is, the, the whole issue of the royal family is divisive anyway. And um, some people have very strong feelings um, against the royal family. Um, some people do not agree with them being appointed and doing what they do. Um, and actually, you know, the royal family has had great impact in other countries which have been detrimental to families and um, to sovereignty, that the country's sovereignty, you know, there's, I, I can't go into the details of it all because I don't really, I can't, I can't, I don't know it all. Um, I'm not really a historian and I'm not somebody who's um, really studied those perspectives, but from what I've read online from people who have uh, found this whole thing to be incredibly triggering um I think that actually you know it's something that um I, I want to approach the subject carefully um you know I don't want to offend anybody or upset anybody with what I'm talking about however I felt that this was something I did want to talk about because from nothing else if anything else I've learned about in astrology is that you can you can talk about anything in astrology from an astrological perspective you can see things that are occurring in the planets and regardless of who you are or what you are nobody can avoid the fact that this is an ongoing dance which is playing into our lives so let's take my aquarian stellium um my mercury and aquarius and my jupiter uranus conjunction in sagittarius and let's step back and look at the bigger picture let's not talk about why you like them or why you don't like them or whatever let's talk about what we saw in the years that she was ruling us and how that is displayed in the chart i guess that's really what i want to do so sorry if it seems a bit um like on the fence I don't mean to come from that approach. It's just that I really feel on the fence about it all because there's so many good things about the royal family that I've witnessed and there's so many uh, difficult things, where, like I said, from whichever perspective you're coming from. And so I want to enjoy the ceremonial aspect of all this and want to enjoy um, just forgetting about some of the more negative things that are implied when we think about the monarchy but it is difficult to completely forget about some of that stuff that's happened. So um, I am a person who will just zoom in on the chart. So here we are. Um, the Queen has 21 degrees and 22 minutes of Capricorn rising. 
what's interesting and I know I've talked about the queen before so I don't want to repeat myself but I'm probably going to a little bit um but yes the queen has got Capricorn rising and what's interesting about her rising degree is that when we had the Saturn Pluto conjunction of 2020 which was the one of the major planetary aspects which ushered in that pandemic um you know I mean I know people sort of say oh the planets don't make stuff happen no but there is a sense of um uh we were we were looking forward to that time and saying what's going to happen so many astrologers for so many years talking about that that massive conjunction it's it was a huge one because Jupiter got involved as well all happened on the queen's ascendant and at the time you could say oh that sounds like it could potentially be quite um difficult for her um definitely as far as health is concerned when Jupiter gets involved because the 12th house is there um but like Saturn rules her um her ascendant and Pluto rules her midheaven and her 11th house cusp I'm looking at the equal house system by the way and um you know so there's a lot of uh, you know like reputation um the 11th house would be you know um I guess if we're looking at the monarchy and looking at the chart astrology as a tool for um the royal family which you know astrology used to be only for royals like it was only for the monarchy and you know the people weren't you couldn't have your own chart read you you know it was a tool that was saved for the you know the absolute elite top people people on the top of the pile basically um so yes the sun generally in a chart especially if you're looking at like a country chart for example um in mundane astrology would usually depict the ruler um, the person in charge so um you know as far as astrology is concerned and applying it to the queen it's pretty much um one of the most one of the oldest applications is to look at a royal chart and look at somebody who's ruling the country and be able to look at their chart and see what's upcoming for them and potentially how it could impact the country and often in these mundane charts not necessarily the queens but in these mundane charts the moon would indicate the people society um but yes i would say the 11th house has a sense of that as well and um yeah she's got her midheaven in scorpio and saturn on the midheaven saturn sitting in 24 and the midheaven at 25 now we know when she was born um she wasn't in line um it wasn't the case that she was in line for the throne i think when she was very young she um her father's her uncle abdicated i don't know the exact dates but her uncle abdicated and at that point, um, I wonder if it says it on her astro.com page. Bear with me. I'm just going to quickly click over because I do have that page open. Or I did anyway. Where is it? Where? Hmm, what have I done with it? I definitely had it open. Let's go back in, shall we? Where is the queen? There she is. There she is. She's got a double A rating, by the way, as well. So while I'm looking at this, I'll tell you, she's got zero degree sun in Taurus and her moon is 12 degrees Leo. So she's got really early degrees, fixed Earth, sun, mid degrees, fixed fire, moon. <laughs> Gosh, I've got to put my teeth in. I'm like, my, I think because I'm not feeling so well, I'm like, oh, my brain is not working. Um, and then she's got, uh, the fixed midheaven Saturn there in the later degrees um, still mid to later not quite and then she's also got um, a Mars Jupiter conjunction mid to late degrees of Aqu um, Aquarius as well so she's got the thing is with the queen she's got a lot of fixity in her chart um, and uh, we'll look at that a little bit more later on let's see what we said here so um at the time oh so no I don't know if it's got it says she became the queen at the age of 25 um at young, as a young girl she was a happy child raised in a close close protective family at the age of 10 on the 20th of January 1936 her grandfather King George V died and left the throne to her uncle Edward VIII her uncle abdicated the throne on the 11th of December 1936 so not long after being appointed, actually, literally like 10, 11 months later, uh, leaving the monarchy for her father, King George V, uh, the sixth. Uh, 
uh, at 11, the eldest daughter of George V, sorry, George VI, came heir to the British throne. So she was at 11, she became the, the heir to the throne at 11 years old. So from 11 years old, she had a huge responsibility, an absolutely huge responsibility. And um, you could, yes, you could sort of see that in the chart, really. You can see that not only does she have this Capricorn, this responsible Capricorn rising and Saturn on the midheaven, it, it, it feels like, you know, there are sometimes there are no accidents sometimes these things are the way they are meant to be i'm not saying there's no choice and there's no freedom to change your your course in life but some things are it's like i said before there are some things that are just meant to be some some points on the map that you are just meant to visit and then you have freedom of how you want to get to those places and i definitely think with queen elizabeth it was her destiny to be the queen um because actually not only that she's also got her nodes sitting there along the ascendant and descendant so she has you see with a lot of people that the nodes are prominently placed so prominently placed is like you know ascendant or the sun's there the moon's there you know if somebody's born on an eclipse for example that's quite um prominent and perhaps if the mcic Sorry, that was a cat toy. Um, so perhaps if the MC or IC, um, you know, the um, nodes are there as well, that can also have a similar feel. But it doesn't mean you're all going to be the king or queen or president or prime minister. Um, but there, they do seem to, that it seems to be a theme with people that are destined to do what they're meant to do. There is a real sense of calling for them. Um, so I can see that in her chart, and I think that's really interesting. Um, but on top of that, like I've said, you know, she's got the, um, the, you know, that Saturn, heavy Saturn on the midheaven like that. Um, so she's, you know, definitely um, aspires to looking up to people who have that, who carry that weight with dignity. And, um, you know, she definitely was dignified and she definitely maintained the respect of everybody that I've spoken to the majority of people that I've spoken to everybody says you know I wasn't a great royalist or you know I didn't really care about the royal family but I really respected the queen you know and a lot of people have said that there's just um a sense of you know she did what she had to do from 11 years old understanding that she would one day be the queen of the country and little did she know how soon that day would come even less did she know how long she would be doing that for to have been the queen for 75 years of her life to literally have worked two days up until her death um i mean that's somebody who carries the cross of saturn um with great respect and great stoicism and um you know she showed a sense of humor as well in um years to come when she was in the opening credits of the or she she was part of the um opening performance of the olympics where she apparently skydived out of a plane or a helicopter or something in a james bond skit and um she did something for her i think it was for her jubilee when she had a jam sandwich in her handbag and you know she did little fun things and stuff like that so she showed that she had a sense of humor and um i think maybe that that playfulness can come down to having her moon in leo um you know having a the warmth of a fire moon um particularly uh the moon in uh leo for example there's some there is a warmth about it there is a sense of um it, people do tend to like this um I, I you know it depends on your sinistry anyway but generally you know anybody that's got a bit of leo in their chart is able to court the cameras quite well they do find themselves naturally drawn to the spotlight whether they actually want to be or not and with a moon in Leo, there is an ability to perform, um, a natural uh, ability to perform is just part of um, who they are and what they do. So though she didn't seem to be a great performer in many respects and she was quite private, um, there is a sense of um, understanding that part of her role as this royal was to be uh, a public face and to be somebody we were familiar and would recognise. I spoke to a friend of mine who um, is from New Zealand and she's been in the UK for the past four years. 
And she told me that um, over there as well, they have the Queen's face on all of the money and stuff. I said to her, what's it like coming to the UK and then experiencing something like this? And she said, um, it really wasn't as much of a like shock to her, like a culture shock coming to the UK in the first place, because the notes all have the Queen's head on. And, you know, it's like a very familiar experience for her. So she never really felt that out of sorts. It almost felt like a home from home for her. But, um, you know, I think that I don't know about all of the Commonwealth countries. Um, I'm not sure whether they all have the Queen's head on the, the money, on the currency or not. But it's definitely interesting to think about the impact of having your face everywhere, like on the stamps, on the passports, on the um, on the currency. You know, it's just everywhere. And as previously working for the civil service and having um, been there while um, I, I think it was David Cameron's government um, was in power. I think I started off when it was um, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and then David Cameron. That's that. that those were the years. And, and then Theresa May was the Home Secretary, and um, so I worked under Theresa May as the Home Secretary for a while, and then um, she became Prime Minister. But all the while, the Queen was the Queen throughout every single Prime Minister we've had since Churchill up until Liz Truss. Uh, we've had that many different prime ministers and uh, the queen has been a constant. Um, and I would walk into work every day and there'd be a, a photograph of the queen on the wall, you know, like a, a big portrait um, in every single civil service home office building that I worked in. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that is just part of the subliminal, um, I'm not say like subliminal messaging, but just part of your daily life, everywhere you go, every everything you do, there was a little bit of something there like there, I know there were a couple of coins sitting I'm just sitting at a table right now and I know I had a couple of coins on this table with the queen's head on you know it's just it's just a given that it's there um and so it's very interesting to think that um that's all going to change you know currency is going to change money's going to change all to you know depict king charles the third so um the queen I think what's interesting um about her let's go back to this sense of being a constant the bbc referred to her as a reassuring constant if if ever you could describe taurus as something it is a reassuring constant generally taurians are those people in your life who are reassuringly always going to be there they're the rock they don't seem to be swayed there's just like that that core that central pillar of a taurus is so strong and so unbendable that you know when it comes down to it they will always be there to support you um now i know there are plenty of taurians going through a uranus transit right now um so they might say yeah well actually i had a few wobbles um that's that's you, you know like uranus in taurus can be the um a bit of an earthquake for some um for sure um so you know just interesting just interesting to sort of think about that the bbc calling her a reassuring constant and for me you know um me doing my talk on sunday about archetypes i absolutely looked at this triggered a whole different thought process for me because i started thinking about what um what an archetype is for us and the queen is 100 percent an archetype which i think is why it's so hard for a lot of people knowing that there's change in this area because we are experiencing um, the replacement of an, you know, an archetype that we've become so familiar and so we've trusted for so long. And there's a lot of um, uncertainty about how things will be under King Charles. Um, it's just, it's just the whole shift is very interesting. Now, um, what is interesting is that the eclipses that happened this year. Let's have a see if I can um, call up. Um, a second chart i've got charles there but let's just do now and um let's swap Ooh, two for three and get rid of charles for a second so um let's see if we can go back to a date when was when were the eclipses so we had an eclipse on the 16th of may 16th of may um, so yes, you can see that. So this was on the Queen Elizabeth. So I see. Um, so the uh, eclipse was at twenty five. Was it actually at twenty five? It must have been. Yeah, at twenty five. Um, in fact, I've got my ephemeris right here. 
Let's have a wee butchers. Um, so yeah, 2022, May the 16th, the eclipse was at um yeah, 25 18 Scorpio. So um there we go, and it was on her IC, which is you know. I know when I had a full moon, um, it was the moon, the moon was um, on my, um, in my fourth house. I do remember feeling a sense of um, emotional exposure and, um, you know, it highlighted to me some instability, some emotional instability um, um, or reflected that back to me. But for a, um, yes, for the sun to be down there on her IC and the moon up on the midheaven, um, you know, it it was it was bound to be an interesting year for the royal family with the eclipses highlighting the queen so prominently. Um, and as we know, um, as I was saying, you know, traditionally astrology was for the rich. It was for the ruling classes. And, you know, when we would look at a chart um, generally in those days, the sun was the queen or king it was it would have been the king usually. But it was, you know. In this case, it was the Queen. And um, to see that the eclipse was highlighting her midheaven and I see, you'd have to say that there's definitely going to be a lot of, um, you know, home. And it's the work-life balance axis for me, I think. It's like kind of the MCIC, the work-life balance, perhaps the the reputation and the, um, you know, the family unit, um, you know, and how it affects you on a um, public but also personal level um for this to be happening so as we know eclipses come in pairs and let's see when was the other eclipse oh see the, the other eclipse which was the partial eclipse was at 10 taurus and that was the partial lunar eclipse um is that right the lunar eclipse um so let's have a quick look and see or the partial solar eclipse i should say so um and that was at 10 so she and that would have been square her moon as well so um so she, those eclipses were really hitting the queen's chart um interestingly and we also have some eclipses coming up don't we because i think is it october where is it oh no it might be november actually yes so october november we have an eclipse at two scorpio and we also have an eclipse at um, 16 Scorpio as well. So two Scorpio and 16 Scorpio. So that's in October. So two Scorpio, um, which will be um, opposite the Queen's sun and uh, 16 Scorpio, which again will be square her moon. Um, interestingly. So, um, you know, these things are... You know, actually looking at that eclipse as well that was um, in May, which is at 25 and on her IC, um, is square her Mars Jupiter. And Mars is in her first house. So when somebody has Mars in the first house, it describes having a great sense of vitality, like a lot of energy, a lot of strength, um, a, a lot of get up and go and a lot of fight in them. And so her having that in her first house by equal um, with Jupiter as well, like that enhances. It's like a power up, isn't it? So, you know on top of having all this fixity and sort of being around for such a long time all these fixed planets here to have mars in that fixed sign in the first house being blown up by jupiter and look at that saturn um so this was back in may if we go to now look saturn is on her mars at the moment and this is that is if anything's going to deplete your energy i mean there's a couple in the chart i would say saturn will very um, much force you to put the brakes on um, in a in a Mars sense, and Neptune also um, is depleting as well when it comes to Mars. It's a total. It's it will wash you out. I'm trying to think of the names now. Things like chronic fatigue, um, what they called autoimmune. Sometimes they present like that when you've got like Neptune to Mars. The Queen obviously is having Saturn to her Mars, so um, you know that also, like I said, quite a depleting transit um, and quite challenging. So. You know, the eclipses are something that tend to, you know, impact uh, in a in a large way, particularly if it's picking up on some of your 
personal planets or your luminaries um you know it's, it's definitely a big time usually of change whether you're ready for it or not and that's why they got such a bad reputation um sometimes health can be implied um so you know not always but you know it's it's always um something that i don't know as far as as far as i'm concerned so far it keeps us guessing um generally so um i thought it'd be interesting to look at that also interesting um just to look at this t square that the queen has which is her mars jupiter conjunction straddling the first and second house there and then opposite neptune and then square to her saturn on the midheaven plus her mc as well it's a really tight t-square as well it's you know there it's within two degrees orb really the whole thing apart from mars is four degrees um from saturn but you know with that conjunction with jupiter it really is a very tight t-square and it's going from her first and second to the eighth as well and then square to the 11th now um i think what's interesting about this is i think this kind of describes her being the queen who um brought us from uh you know an an age of relative secrecy with what happens as far as ceremonies and traditions are concerned to being thrust into the public eye i think this is where you can see her having to battle with maintaining an element of privacy um you know and upholding some of the mysteries that are surrounding some of the ceremonies that they would have um you know preserved throughout the many years of um royal tradition so you can see that in the eighth house um you know neptune in the eighth um it, I, I think that that can be the invasiveness of paparazzi and television and you know having something like the bbc where you can kind of control the um release of information or um at least have some say in how things are you know the BBC are pretty much like the Queen's broadcasters, aren't they? They're the approved broadcasters for the country. So they kind of carry the message that, you know, is approved by our royal family to an extent, you know. Um, and so this opposite the Mars Jupiter. Now, I think this Mars Jupiter in Aquarius. Always I see Mars and Jupiter together and I and I get the it's like cowboy energy. It's real like um you know a uh, cowboy firing his gun in all directions on top of a horse um but in aquarius maybe um it, i don't know it feels it definitely feels like it's a little bit different it's not your typical country and western is it um it feels a bit more outlandish really doesn't it and um actually she's got uh slightly wide but still there nonetheless a uh, Uranus and Mercury conjunction, Mercury in Aries and Uranus in Pisces. So Uranus, uh, sorry, Mercury is disposited by Mars in Aries. And then she has Neptune, sorry, Uranus, which is disposited by Neptune. So this T-square is kind of in charge of her Mercury-Uranus conjunction. So I think there's a real sense that it's in the third house of communication as well. So we know that she wasn't really allowed to say what she really thought. We know that she had to, if anything happened, she was never allowed to comment and she was never really allowed to share an opinion. Um, and on top of that, not really allowed to show any kind of true emotion or anything either. So interesting that she has got this very outspoken Mercury placement in Aries that would know it's very, what I appreciate about Aries is they really do generally tend to know the best way to do something um every Aries that I know or everyone with an Aries moon they've really got a good idea of how to go from A to B as quickly as possible in the most effective way not necessarily in some ways there is a lot of time and planning and thought going into strategy is important but often if you want to get something done you can give the job to an Aries and they will do it their way and they will do it you know well um and quickly um but yes having this restriction on her um communication so she can't really say what she wants to i guess that describes the the lack of true i don't I, I, usually when i see mercury and uranus together I, I see truth speaker in some way but i feel like there was a sense of not really being able to speak too much of the truth um as far as that's concerned um and uh yeah that uranus as well is up there it's trying her midheaven um her is trying her saturn on the midheaven which is also interesting because we've just found ourselves in and we're still under the influence of a saturn 
uh, Uranus square. So let's open up the, um, let's go here for transits again. So where's Saturn at the moment? Saturn's here on her Mars and Uranus is down here. As you can see, they are both retrograde and they are both kind of very similar degrees. Um, so she's experiencing this, um, you know, this kind of Saturn Uranus square. In fact, you could almost say that, you know, it's it's like an opposite T square where it's like Mars opposite her moon, slightly wide, but still there. And then apexing at transiting Uranus. So this is all like a, a huge period of change for the royal family, because obviously whatever happens to the queen, it's going to filter down. It's going to impact um, everybody below. Um, so, you know, I don't really need, I don't feel the need to look at like the day she passed away or anything like that. I don't feel like that's really necessary. Um, it's just interesting to see how much um, the eclipses have picked up on her chart and how much change has been ushered in as a result, because we know that these eclipses with the Uranus being so close to the nodes, um, these eclipses have been um, pivotal um, for some of the change that we've witnessed. And, uh, you know, Uranus was obviously going to be, as Frank Clifford put it in his um, class towards the beginning of the year, um, Uranus was going to be electrifying the eclipse season. So this is, we're between eclipse seasons at the moment. You know, we're these two eclipses that happened back in May, uh, I think was it um, April, May time. And now we've got October um, and November time appro fast approaching. This is all about the change that's being um, ushered in, everything that's happening as a result of um, the current dance of the north and south node through Scorpio and Taurus. We kind of knew that Uranus and Taurus was going to be a big deal. There's a lot that's happened since. Um, and, you know, this T-square in the, in the Queen's chart being, um, uh, you know, I really think it's, uh, you know, the, the tradition is challenged through this Uranus in the third. She's able to think um, independently and, you know, impartially um, about, you know, how to pro be progressive. It's a progressive combination. I think that's very progressive. Um, it's very um, fluid and um, adaptable that Uranus and her Mercury is uh, in that cardinal Aries, cardinal fire. There's a sense of understanding that change is needed, uh, especially over such a long reign. Like maybe if there had been many monarchs, change would be implemented with each one and we wouldn't think so much of it. Um, and, you know, the fact that relationships have been such a huge, um, a huge instigator of um the change of attitude towards royal pairings as well is so interesting so looking at her uncle um and his wife um and him having to abdicate because of you know he wanted to marry somebody who'd been twice divorced previously and wasn't really approved of uh, in the royal family and then we i know that there are similarities between him and with um, harry and Meghan. And now Harry, uh, you know, he was allowed to marry her. That was OK. But they've decided to go and live their own life abroad. But, um, you know, it's just interesting that um, the attitudes had to change. The fact that Charles is now king and was able to marry Camilla and she's now queen consort. You know, I think it would have potentially, you know, he was forced to be in that relationship. And, um, you know, it's doing his duty um in order to um satisfy his professional role his destiny um which is unfortunate because if you do i know myself personally i can't do something i cannot do something if i don't have the right feeling for it if i feel it's not for me if i am in love with somebody um i can't pretend to not be it's just not possible and it's like astrology. I am an astrologer. This is just who I am. This is just what I do. And I can't be anything else. And I think with Charles, it's like, you know, he knows that he had this job to do. And he also knows that, um, you know, he didn't really ever truly love Diana. It's a sad, unfortunate story, regardless of what you think happened or your perspective on it. Let's just actually focus on the human aspect um and the astrology that feeds into that rather than thinking about other stuff because it's easy to go down those rabbit holes trust me I, I enjoy going down a few rabbit holes I've got an eighth house sun and a Scorpio moon who doesn't love to go down a rabbit hole but um yeah as far as that's concerned 
um, you know, there was great change that was needed in the royal family and relationships were was one of those things that had to be reviewed um, among, uh, you know, various other policies and traditions. You know, it's the great the great sort of um, change into modern living. They as when I watched the crown, you know, they have to they say, you know, the crown, we have to keep the crown relevant. You know, people need to believe in the crown. And, you know, it's like a you know, even the royal family almost is a belief system because the only people putting them the the only reason they're still there is because we are um i say allowing it enabling it but you know it's other countries have overthrown their royalty um and you know it's just one of those it's an interesting thing to me to think that the way that they phrased it in that tv show it's almost as though people have to believe in it that it's, it's something that all the while we believe it's like anything it's like any power you know the belief and the faith in the people in charge is what keeps them there if we didn't have faith if we didn't believe in them we did we wouldn't have to have that system in place um so yeah so it's just a very very interesting chart where she's been she's in her duty because of a sense of tradition um she's had to deal with the uh, you know a, a neptune saturn square is a tough one to deal with at the best of times because there is this sense of um, wanting to implement stability and structure, stoicism, respect, authority, and then having this wishy-washy Neptune who um, isn't necessarily all about that kind of thing. And, um, you know, like the invasiveness, the the way things can leak in with Neptune or leak out. And also, you know, Neptune can be scandal. And, you know, she's had plenty of scandal through her family, um, through some of the things she's had to deal with throughout the years. Um so I do think this is a really interesting T-square um, and just her, you know, her ongoing ability to um, shift and to um, provide a stable and familiar um, and, you know, a position that we can respect regardless of our stance on the, uh, you know, the things that the monarch have done, the, the, um, the monarchy has done. It's something that we have to admit that like 75 years in your job, it's a long time for anybody to be in a job, um, to be doing what they do. Um, so really, really interesting chart. And that seventh house um, moon might also be um, an indicator of, you know, the prominent role of relationships as well as how much she was serving others uh, in her duty. And that Saturn Pluto conjunction um, with the Jupiter sitting there on her chart, uh, on her ascendant was potentially indicative of um you know the great impact of the past few years and how that would um how she would how she would conduct herself um through those challenges as well so um very interesting and yes you did see right i did have charles's chart as well um so let's have a quick um swap two for three i might actually put charles let's do let's just have a quick look at just him and his mum quick so his son is at 22 Scorpio, um, which happens to sit right up there with her Saturn. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about the Queen and Charles is they've both got Sun Chiron conjunctions. It looks like um, so hers is at 28 Aries and his is at 28 Scorpio. And, you know, Aries and Scorpio are both Mars ruled signed signs. You know, Aries um, is the um, active and Scorpio is the passive Um rulership of mars as well the passive energy so interesting that it's both you know mars ruled um he's also got a, a very wide it's so wide but you know a very wide mars jupiter there that is you know it's almost 10 degrees of orb or oh, nine degrees of orb separate however with jupiter involved you can be a bit more generous with the orb so yes he's got a mars jupiter conjunction as well um and uh, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? When you look at these charts and you can see, look, he's got his Venus and um, Neptune there and um, in Libra. And I do believe that Princess Diana had, I don't know if it was like Sun trying Neptune and there was a strong Venus in her chart. I can't remember where it was um, off the top of my head, but yeah, the the, the very public um, and the very um, publicized aspect of his relationships, his personal relationships. Um, so. So, yeah, interesting stuff. And yes, he obviously was picked up on the eclipses as well. 
I'd imagine potentially that um, around the time of these eclipses is maybe when her health had begun to decline um, in a more obvious way, um, you know, and we know she couldn't go on forever. Um, in fact, she was born a year after my grandmother and passed away a year after my grandmother. So, you know, maybe that's why there's a sense of like um, great respect for her as well, because one of the things I've said to a few of my friends is it's almost like she has been everyone's grandmother and she's gone now. And so uh, some of us didn't get an opportunity to say goodbye to our grandparents during the pandemic and stuff like that. Um, I know it was difficult for me to be able to say goodbye to my grandmother. Um, you know, just, you know, I was pregnant at the time as well. It was very difficult to go and visit and stuff. It was just practically impossible, actually. Um, so in some senses, um, this extended grief period that we've had in the United Kingdom has allowed me to grieve more for that loss than I ever did at the time. Um, not in a horrible way. I don't mean it in a horrible way. It's just, you know, sometimes we aren't able to do the grieving we need to. And this period has been grief on a level for people to be able to allow themselves to grieve for all sorts of things, not just for the queen. Um, but the, the public grief has been incredible to, to witness. Anyway, let's have a quick look at Charles. So Charles has got a um, moon in Taurus at zero. So that's on the queen's sun, isn't it? There we go. Yep, yeah, they've got that sun moon conjunction. So interesting. Um, and then, yep, yeah, it's uh, his Scorpio stuff's in the fourth. The Leo rising. There you go. That that regal royal Leo placement. His Pluto was very close to her moon as well. Um, and his Saturn in the in the first house. There's a real sense of um, duty. Um, having that in the first I think I read somewhere that he is a record holder now for being the oldest person ever to become king the oldest monarch appointment ever how old is he now 70 where did I read it was he 75 74 I think it was on the wikipedia page actually the astro astro wiki page there's charles um 73 sorry He's the oldest person ever to assume the British throne. So um, that's interesting, isn't it? So, yes, as you can see, the eclipses were on his sun. Um, he's got his moon at zero Taurus. So, again, an another, there is a sense of stability about Charles. Um, he has got some mutability in there, but not huge amounts. But there does seem to be a sense of familiarity about him stepping into this role and a lot of people don't agree that he should be a lot of people don't really like the idea of Charles being king and there's an awful lot of stuff in the royal family some of the scandal that I mentioned earlier was Prince Andrew and his um uh you know connection to underage girls which you know all of us would have said mm, there's a big question of doubt over this but actually um just recently they paid off I think it was something like 14 million pounds. can't remember how many millions um, to to pay the girl off rather than go to court over what happened because um, Ghislaine Maxwell, um, what was that? Something that she was found guilty and it was all because of, um, oh, now his name's going to, oh gosh, the guy that got, well, the guy who died in prison, but they suspect was murder. I can't remember his name now. But yes, all of that connection to, um prince andrew and even that there were pictures of them on holiday in balmoral and stuff you know not really very good stuff for the royal family so there was that um and obviously all the stuff with um, charles and camilla and the relationships and when charles and diana were together jimmy savile the most prolific sex offender the uk i think has ever known um that all came out the jimmy savile stuff all came out when saturn was in scorpio I think, I can't remember when, what year that was that that all came out, but um, it was around the time Saturn was at about 28 Scorpio. Um, or was that like 2012 or something? And um, yes, it came out that we, like in the 80s and the 90s, Jimmy Savile had been a relationship counsellor for Princess Diana and, and Prince Charles. So very odd to appoint somebody like that as your relationship counsellor. Um, I've got here just opened up the ephemeris. It looks like around 2015 um, was when Saturn was in Scorpio at those degrees. So, yeah, around 2014, 2015. And um, around those times as well was the Uranus Pluto square. So big shakeup times. 
Um, so yeah, this has been a relatively long talky one. I didn't want to look too much at Charles. Oh, look at that. He's got a Jupiter Uranus opposition in Sagittarius and Gemini there. That's an interesting opposition. Jupiter Uranus conjunctions. Uh, I've got Jupiter Uranus in uh, Sagittarius and that conjunction is quite cool. Um, but to have the opposition as well, I think is quite an interesting one. And what is going to be interesting for Charles is that um, the I was talking to Anne Whitaker about this, you'll remember, um, a few episodes, or was it the last episode that came out? And the in uh, April 2024, at 21.50, there will be a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. So that will be on Charles's son, close, very close to his son as well in 2024. So um, interesting that he will be having that conjunction on his son, which I'd imagine will tie in with this opposition that he has in his chart in the fifth to the 11th house. What it means right now without going into deep analysis, I don't know, but it's going to sextile his uh, moon there as well, um, as you can see. Um, oh, no, that X sextiles his moon. So he's got um, his moon sextile, the Jupiter Uranus sextile and trine, that conjunction, that opposition, sorry. So that's an interesting one to look at as well. Um, but anyway, um, without, like I said, going into deep analysis of Charles's chart, um, I just thought it'd be really interesting to just look at the Queen, look at, uh, you know, the um, just some of the interesting things to comment on about her chart. Um, I know I've touched on her chart in a few episodes recently this past year, um, what with the Jubilee and things like that as well. So anyway, that was just uh, a short sharp exploration which was probably a little bit longer than i was planning um if you would like to be entered into the draw for a magic of eye astrological almanac slash diary um your all you have to do is go to the youtube channel and subscribe and hit the bell while you're there and uh just send me a screenshot to stephanie at stelliumastrology.com that's s-t-e-f-a-n-i-e at stelliumastrology.com and that way you can uh, be entered into the prize draw just in case your channel is private. You don't have to do that. But if you do have a private channel, I won't know that you subscribed and then I can't pull your name out of a hat because I can't put your name on a piece of paper to put it into the hat. So, um, yeah, that's all you need to do to win a Magic of Our Diary. Just subscribe, hit the bell and then screenshot and email me your entry. And um, that's literally it. Um, anything else uh, readings related I'm going to be launching some new services very soon um, I am not always going to be available for face-to-face -face readings over zoom however if you would like to know when these availabilities do come up please join my mailing list I will be letting people know via email through my mailing list when I'm going to have these availabilities you can email me privately as well to inquire and um, I can let you know so again that's stephanie at stelliumastrology.com um, I hope that you've enjoyed today's episode I'm hoping that I don't have any more mercury retrograde issues and um, I look forward to speaking to you guys next week all right take care bye now